to life, we run into numbers that seem important and clearly significant. For example, do you recognize this one? 3.14151. And so what is it? What is it? Five. Yes, you would have been five, that digit have been seven <laughs> instead of four. And what is this 0 0.07? Obviously, James Bond. But it, turns, <laughs> but it turns out to be the surface tension of water against air or vacuum at 25 degrees, a very comfortable room temperature in California, I'm afraid not here, and in joules per meter squared. If, in knowing that, you can understand lots and lots of phenomena in nature. And sometimes I stumble on a number which obviously I have seen before, but which I cannot quite place. For example, this number, 6680561. I have seen it somewhere, but it's no longer in my, relevant in my life, and I mobilized my entire scientific erudition and then experience, tried to estimate some back the calculation and so on. And I cannot really place it until finally, just before this lecture, I saw, yes, Eureka, that is, of course, the tax number of the advanced studies. Now, the light motif of this lecture is this 2.5. That is the motif for this lecture. And I'd like to convince you that that is, in some sense, the natural dimension between 2 and 3, in which paper, any membrane, surface, you name it, evolves and continues to surprise us by its paradoxical behavior, and sometimes rather useful behavior. So as an example, I shall begin with one experiment, a magic trick. I have brought here a coaster, slightly coaster, and a little sheet of paper in which I drew the hole. And this coaster, a disc, goes through this hole, no problem. It is actually going through this hole, like that, as you can see it is through. But when you put one next to the other, it is clear that the disk has a larger diameter than the diagonal of this square. Oh, I do not tear, I do not stretch anything. And yet, the larger one goes through the smaller one. You see, it is really going through. I haven't started cheating yet. And the, uh, it really goes back and forth and back and forth. And obviously, the, what is going through is larger than what is letting it through. How is this possible? Usually I charge money for revealing the secret because <laughs> the, you are such a nice group of people that I shall do it for free. Now, if you fold it like this, the largest gap that I can take advantage of is obviously this gap which used to be the diagonal of this square. But that's not all I do. Now, I grab these parts and start twisting it. And as I do, you can see that the part of the paper starts coming up towards the camera vertically. And I twist until those two edges align, and then squeeze and crease. And then I shift the paper a little bit like this. And in that configuration, the gap that I'm taking advantage of is no longer the diagonal of this, but rather the sum of the two sides. And if you remember cartography, you have gained an extra factor of square root of you know, two, uh, square root of two minus one. So it is 40% or more, I don't know. So you can pass it through. The secret of success then was to make a hole that was whose diagonal was shorter than the diameter, but the sum of the two sides was longer. And you could do this thanks to a very, very simple idea, which is this. That you escaped into the third dimension, I mean, third dimension. Right? You came out and then came back into the original dimension too. And this extra freedom that you allow yourself and you are coming, so the interplane between two dimensions, which is the intrinsic dimension of the paper, and 3D, which is the extrinsic dimension, so to speak, of how it lives in an ambient space, is really the, the theme of this lecture, as I say. So what becomes, uh, what seems to be impossible becomes actually possible. Do you recognize this uh, rather romantic dashing figure? Perhaps the most romantic figure in the history of mathematics, and that is, of course, Galois. Like he died at the young age of 20. In case you are thinking, I cannot do arithmetic because you know, 32 minus 11 seems to be 21. He died shortly before his 21st birthday and a rather tragic, tragic death. Um, he left, of course, a gigantic legacy for us to chew on. One of the things, rather small things, that he allows us to uh, solve very neatly is this a classic, one of the classic Greek problems. Can you, with a ruler and compass, to be a little more precise, strange Asian compass, divide an arbitrary given angle into three equal parts. Dividing, bisecting an angle into two equal parts is very classical, and you probably have a vague memory of this from high school, but the three equal parts, can you? Obviously, there are angles that you can trisect exactly, but that's not what the question is asking. An arbitrary triangle 
can it be dissected, uh, bisected, so, trisected, excuse me, exactly by some algorithm? And the answer is no, because their angles are simple at 60 degrees, which it is possible to prove, cannot be trisected. It's impossible, however clever you are. But there is an ancient and rather popular Japanese art of origami folding paper. And it so happens that with origami, you can trisect everything. So, the idea is very simple. Let's say that your given angle is given as the corner of a sheet of paper. Usually, corner of a sheet of paper, 90 degrees, but let's say you have an angle there. And how do you bisect it? Well, naively, well, you just fold the sheet of paper over, and then you align those two edges and crease over here. And when you open it, you have a very beautiful line that is coming out, which is the bisector of that angle. How do you do trisection? It is no harder. You just fold over, but you overshoot and then fold back. And then you just negotiate those edges. <laughs> and yes, you do. But, no, but it can be done. It's a physical phenomenon. I mean, you, you know, I, I giggle too, but we're giggling because we're coming from uh, what the French call deformation professionnelle of mathematicians. But you know, if you, you are asked a child to do this, shall do it with alacrity and will be successful. So you just fold. And then you negotiate until you are quite aligned and you crease. And when you open, you have two lines that are coming up. And these are the trisectors of the angle. And any section is no harder. You go back and forth, back and forth, and you just do it. OK. So this is successful. And this leads to the next figure. You recognize him, too? That's, um, of course, a giant in mathematics. That was Carl Friedrich Gauss, um, who looks um, rather grumpy. But he, he did also uh, sort of revolutionize mathematics at the junction of the 18th and 19th century. And one of the, again, small things that he allowed us to uh, figure out is the Another classic Greek problem of for which end can you draw a regular polygon of n size, regular n-gon, always with Rulan straight, Rulan compass only. Uh, I gave here a construction for n equals 3, that is an equilateral triangle, that's a traditional method for regular 3 gon. You just draw a segment, pivot the compass here, and draw an arc of circle, pivot it over here, draw another circle or arc, and then intersection is the vertex that you have to connect to the ends of the segment. So as you can imagine, n that is constructible by rule and compass for regular n form has to look like a very, very special number. So it is of the form always, unless the condition is sufficient actually, that it's power of 2, forget about that for the moment, times that's a crucial piece of the information, product of distinct primes, I forgot to say primes, of a very peculiar type, 2 to 2 to small n plus 1. These are called Fermat primes. And if you plug in various values of n, you see this uh, strange sequence, 1, 3, 5, 15, 17, 51, and so on. And pick up, pick up those primes in both sides, 3, 5, 17, these are all constructible. And any product of distinct those times power 2 is also constructible. But the power 2, because you know, once you have constructed something, you can always bisect each of the angles, and then you can double the number size. That's cheap. So that's why you can put power 2 in front, but the essential piece is there. Well, you're probably sus starting to suspect that you can do all n with origami. <laughs> so I shall do this. And, uh, I shall demonstrate that in the case of n equal 5, that is not so exciting, you will say, because it, that was on the list of Fermat primes. But nonetheless, this will illustrate the idea the best it can. So we shall do this. OK. Now, what you do, simply, is to take a strip of paper and then make a knot, the simplest knot that you can, you can imagine, which is like this. OK. Having made, made this, you tighten the knot and flatten it, tighten and flatten it. You keep negotiating, tighten and flatten, tighten and flatten. And eventually, you completely flatten this knotted part, and which is tight. And that's what you get. Now, in order to show you what's happening in the middle, I'll throw away bits that are sticking out. And then I'll demonstrate that what is in the middle is a very beautiful regular pentagon. I didn't do anything. Nature took its own course. And it is a beautiful exercise. Not too difficult to prove that this is a regular pentagon. Okay. Good. If you are lucky enough to visit Japan as a tourist, and the living there is another story, but as a tourist, and stay at the traditional inn called Ryokan, they will typically lend you a nice pajama that you can you know, take a stroll in on a nice summer evening. And uh, together with that, a soft belt. 
And that soft belt is traditionally uh, piled in a pentagonal pattern over to the guest. So this has been known in Japan for hundreds of years. <laughs> and, the, uh, and there is uh, something else that you can do. Um, I've made a regular pentagon. Yeah? Actually, you can make a regular n-gon for all n odd. For example, when you made this knot, you remember? The simplest knot. I should say I made one pass through the knot, you know, to knot it, yeah? And then flattened and tightened it, and that resulted in a regular pentagon, five. It turns out that if you make two passes, next level of complexity up, how do you make two passes? I shall show you a picture in a moment. And then tighten and flatten. What comes out is a regular seven gone, heptagon. And three passes, regular, nine gone, and so on, so on. You can reach all of these. Okay. So. So these are the um, main pictures so far. That's the regular five gone. And seven gone is drawn here. The best way to think about it is to imagine that regular seven gone has already been drawn somewhere in the background, and then go into it like a ray of light. And then imagine that inside is made of mirrors. You go bounce, 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 and then come out. That pattern of bouncing, where you went first and then where you went afterwards, that gives you a pattern of how you fold it. That's that's it. And so you can do do this. Okay. And if you have a, an even going, you're in trouble because you bounce and come out right away. <laughs> okay. So you see that the one pass gives you n equal 5, two passes give you n equal 7, and so on and so on. Ah, but I hear some rumblings of complaint. What about n equal 3? Well, how many passes do you think you should make in order to get to n equal 3? Huh? Of course, zero pass. So you come in, and you try to sort of fold, not it, but you don't succeed and come out. And in that corner, <laughs> you, you see a regular three gone that is an equilateral triangle. So you can cover all odd gones, and then bisection is cheap, so you can double, and you access all n. OK. And finally, in this first part, I shall give you a little present. You see, a present is usually an object. Yeah? And it is maybe expensive, and it is heavy, and when you go through airport security, they complain about it, and so forth. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the present that I brought here today is a phenomenon, or rather a theorem. And that is free for charge, and it's unbreakable. It weighs exactly zero gram. And when you go through Dublin airport, they are no wiser about this. It's, uh, <laughs> so here is a lion that I folded, and when you open it, this is standard origami pattern. Don't pay too much attention to blue and red. These are rage falls and value falls. But what I would like to, you to pay attention to is that if you look at, so it is in some sense an embedded graph for if you like a network that I drew on a sheet of paper. And if you look at each of the vertices, yeah. or those points, there are a number of edges or lines that are coming together at those points. And along each of those points, interestingly, you have always an even number of lines meeting. So here you have four, valency four, valency four, there, there are eight edges, no fewer, that are coming together, and there you have six, and so forth, and so forth. Well, it turns out that for any origami that has been sort of folded, and then you flatten it, and then open, you always have an even number of edges coming together at every vertex. That is a theorem. I'm going to skip over the proof because it's actually not at all difficult proof, but if you are wondering about it, it's because when I squashed it, I made what the mathematicians might call singular covering, and you have front back, front back, that kind of parity issue which forces it, the parity of this. But anyway, so let's accept this, that you always have an even number of edges coming together. So the simplest case looks like this. Okay. So to give you a better representation in real life. In some sense, an even simpler but more degenerate one is what the origami is called square fold, which you use before breakfast every day, and that is that. So you have, I'm going to trace the uh, ridges and the, the folds, creases with pens so that you can see everything's 90 degrees, and of course you use it every day. But that was rather deliberate, and if you don't do it deliberately and rather randomly, what you end up is a fold like this. You see, I did it very randomly, and you have those four edges that are coming together. And one of them is valley, and the other three are ridge. That's also really interesting, but you have those things. OK, that's what it looks like. Well, here's a the theorem. Let's denote, is this uh, looking upside down like this? Yes, it is. So, so I, have to write, I have to write upside down um, alpha 
言いたい<笑>デルタ is particularly difficult to write upside down if you haven't practiced it. I also write the mathematical formulas and so forth. Do I have time for a little digression? Yes, I do, don't I? The entire talk is, in some sense, a digression from the Right. So, in Cambridge, where I used to be before my happy move to Stanford, I didn't say happy move to Stanford, anyway, my move to Stanford, I used to do those tutorials, the supervisions, where I have some two or three students around a big, big old table. And in the beginning of the year, of course, to new students, I would give this supervision, and we have lots and lots of paper, and then draw formulas and pictures, and then teach. And I made a point, obviously, of writing everything upside down so that they can see best. And that really impressed them. That's the effect that I was looking for. But every year, I would have one or two students who noticed nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they are destined for greatness. Anyway, so those are angles. Now, these angles cannot be arbitrary. Those alpha, beta, gamma, delta, if they are created by folding a sheet of paper, or if you like, clumsy sheet, and then squatting, these angles are not arbitrary. It turns out that, first, those angles must add to 360 degrees. You didn't wish that you said it first, but I did. But the more interesting part of the of the theorem is that opposing pairs of angles must add up to the same sum. That is, alpha plus gamma must equal to beta plus delta. For example, this kind of picture, however clever you are, cannot be produced by crushing a sheet of paper and the opening. Because the sum of this thin wedge plus this large sector is far too large compared with the sum of the other two. The theorem is usually attributed to Kawasaki, but there are some sort of um, earlier results by uh, uh, Fushimi, uh, Japanese physicist, and so forth. But anyway, it is a very beautiful result. That's my present. I'll make sure that you can take it home by proving it. In order to prove this, you remember what we are trying to prove is alpha plus beta equals gamma beta plus delta. All right. In order to prove this, let's go back to how this was made. That was the angle alpha, right? Seen from the other angle, that's also alpha, but alpha is beta plus delta, oops, minus gamma. Did you understand that? No, you were too, you were too fast, so that's good. So this is alpha, yeah? And then seen from the other side, that's also alpha. But alpha consists of the two pieces that overlap in beta plus delta, and the overlap is actually gamma. So alpha equals beta plus delta minus gamma, QED. Right. This could have been discovered by Euclid, or others, but um, that's where you saw it. Okay. And in general, what you have is that the, if you have an even number of angles coming in together, for example, alpha 1, alpha 2, and so on, so on, all the way to alpha 2n, there is a necessary and sufficient condition locally at the vertex that they can be created by folding a sheet of paper and crushing. And the necessary sufficient conditions are that they add up to, of course, 360 degrees, and the following condition. Not the sum, but what the, we call alternating sum. Um, of course, you know, the alpha 1 plus all those angles, you know, they'll be given in some arbitrary order. And especially if I ask Nima, he's a mischievous person, so he's going to ram, jam up the, so the, so the, disturb the order and give them to me in the wrong order. But I'm saying, if I can find a certain reordering such that this alternating sum, plus alpha 1, minus alpha 2, plus alpha 3, minus alpha 4, plus minus alpha 2, closes to zero, then I can make those angles by just folding sheet paper and crushing. I might have to reorder before, but that's the necessary and sufficient condition, and the proof is exactly the same. What do I do? Among those numbers, I take the largest in magnitude. And then start folding back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And when I run, run out of the supply of those real numbers, I know that I close exactly thanks to that closure condition, and then squeeze and you know, crease and then open, and you have those beautiful lines that realize your condition. This closure, I keep saying closure, is really because it's analogous to homological, homological closure condition. And you are seeing kind of the the beginning of some discrete version of, uh, of cohomology there. But anyway, that's what it is. All right. So far, we have been playing with uh, mathematics. And we'll gently transit towards physics. And later, even more gently and subtly, and rather imaginatively, we'll start going out to physiology and engineering and so on. Indeed, we have to expand the uh, area of investigation, because the phenomena that we are talking about exists across all scales in the universe. Yeah all over the place. For example, 
Um, you have this uh, little picture in the corner of what is called Mino paper in Japan. So this paper is made in a rather funny way. You take a sheet of paper, you wet it, moisten it, and then you scrub it with a hot persimmon. Yeah, persimmon fruit. And then you just do it. After you have scrubbed it enough, and then you just crumple it and dry it. And then after that, you open it. And then you scrub it with a persimmon, and you keep repeating. And somehow this process of scrubbing with persimmon puts a lot of filaments and tangles them together and makes them so strong, those entanglements, that you can, from this paper, make, for example, clothes, bags, even shoes. And they last for quite a long time, I trust this time. And those phenomena are happening on a scale of less than a millimeter, certainly. Or in the top left, right corner, excuse me, you have my favorite uh, friend. And his trunk is lined with lots and lots of creases, wrinkles. And they're the best of biomechanical and thermal reasons why biology is very adept at uh, taking advantage of those wrinkles. And that is happening on our scale, let's say, between centimeter and meter, that kind of thing. And nature plays at this game on huge scales as well. Here's the backbone of Latin America, but that's the Andes. And how did Andes form? Well, naturally, you have this uh, plate, South American plate, and the Pacific on the other side, to be precise, Nazca plate. The Nazca plate started pushing against it, and if you push one thing after another, uh, against another, what's going to happen? Of course, this will happen. And that's the mountain, and that's the Andes. And it's happening on the scale of more than a kilometer, well, actually 1,000, 2,000 kilometers long, and so on. And Himalayas, of course, are being formed. In fact, they are getting higher and higher because um, India is pushing against the continent, and the Alps themselves very close to you. Of course, the result of Africa pushing against Europe, and so on. So they are just across all scales, and depending on how you know, they relate to the humans, they have different names. If you design them very, very carefully, and that's they are called origami, at the other end, if you just randomly crumple, did something that's called crumpling, and between there is this, so to speak, modular and really fundamental unit of these things, which you might call buckling. I shall come back to that in a moment. And the challenge is, can you extract any laws of nature from all these phenomena, including in the case of random crumpling? For example, here you see a, a photograph that looks like that of a crumpled sheet of paper, because it happens to be a crumpled sheet of paper. <laughs> well, but you know, if you ask an artist, even Leonardo da Vinci, you know, um, to draw a crumpled sheet of paper, you see that almost no artist can. It's extremely difficult to draw a, a convincing looking crumpled sheet of paper, and yet we, who have lived in this universe longer, in this case, because I come from the dinosaur era, or short, shortly, because there are some young people here, you know, instinctively recognize a chronicle sheet of paper from a completely sort of generic um, embedded graph of you know, lines and, and points and so on. So what is it that we're seeing? Okay? And so there must be a set of mathematicians called obstructions or conditions that a generic um, embedded graph must satisfy in order to qualify as the nobility that comes from the crumpled sheet of paper. So what are those conditions? Yeah, any idea? <coughs> and so we shall begin to do this. And one thing that the, if you agree that the crumpling means that after that you squash, then all those points, in fact this was made by squashing, are automatically satisfying that theory. Yeah? It's amazing. Automatically. So nature really doesn't go, doesn't go to rest. Okay. So that's the going to be our project for the second part of the talk. Do you recognize this man? He's a little less uh, dashing and famous, but he looks more content with the life. <laughs> That's Simon Denis Poisson. When you do, of course, mathematics and physics, you run into him all over the place, in you know, Poisson bracket, and Poisson distribution probability, and Poisson this, and Poisson equation, Poisson this, and Poisson that, and so on. But what I would like to discuss today is, in case you have um, studied physics a long, long time ago, and there is a very useful and not um, ugly piece of physics called the theory of elasticity. And I'd like to remind us half of theory of elasticity, so to speak, in 45 seconds. Here we go. So you take a piece of material, and you squeeze it in one direction. What do you think will happen? Well, of course, the material will bulge out in response in the transverse direction. How much it bulges out? But how much it was squeezed in, that ratio, more rigorously infinitesimal ratio, is called the Poisson ratio. Equivalently, if you pull it mm -mm, and the shrinks its girth, how much you went in per how much you went out is that uh, red over blue. That's the Poisson ratio. Okay. Well, 
Poisson ratio is important, as you can see, because it is a characteristic of the behavior of, if you like, the transverse response of a material. But in the literature, there is a huge mess. I mean, for something as standard as that, there are lots and lots of different denotations. For example, lambda Lipschitz, whom we will meet in a moment, denoted it by sigma, and some people denote it by pi, or oh, God forbid. And some people call it lambda. That's terrible, because that should be a lambda constant. And then people who should know better call it p, and so on and so on. Well, after many years of um, Zen cogitation and sort of training of my soul and so forth, I finally hit the phone at the God-given, or rather Tadashi-given, notation for Poisson ratio. Yeah? And it is this. <laughs> <laughs> so in 200 years time, I would like the history of science to remind me, remember me as the person who finally discovered the, the right notation for oscillation from this time onward, please, for the rest of your life, whenever you talk about personal ratio, use that notation. Okay, let's train our intuition a little bit. If you have a unit cell or fundamental domain, which is made like that, so those black dots are supposed to be universal joints and the bluish lines are rigid rods, and if you make a gadget like this and squeeze it along the blue arrows, naturally you can see it expands along the red arrows. That is, you know, transverse response and that's the Poisson ratio. You can already assemble that into a structure and make something like that, and this is already useful. Um, in designing clothes, if you have a clothes like this, and by, for example, uh, stretching in this direction, it hugs your body rather tightly and so forth. And that is right on the positive person response, because it's normal. You can replace the fundamental cell by something other than that. So, for example, a hexagon, you have honeycomb pattern, and it responds in a similar fashion. And that's, again, positive. Well, to be honest, the Poisson ratio of a material or structure varies a lot from one context to another. But there is a common traditional belief, um, which is that potential ratio should always be positive. That is, it's rather absurd to think of material which, upon being squeezed, also shrinks in the transverse direction. But mind you, there are some materials or structures that have almost zero Poisson ratio. For example, take a spring. I'm not sure that this is the best example, but if you take a spring and compress it longitudinally, it doesn't look as if it's actually getting fatter. But if you look very, very carefully, it's getting a little fatter. So the Poisson ratio is almost zero, but strictly speaking, it is positive. This uh, belief that Poisson ratio should be positive is sustained and supported by the best of the authorities, for example, Randa Lipschitz. I sort of use no other book more often than Randa Lipschitz in my life. I don't know why I took the uh, French translation, because I'm visiting Bruno Marna, perhaps. So volume uh, seven of the Monumentos um, Course of Theoretical Physics, Randa Lipschitz, is about the theory of elasticity. In the corner, by the way, you see Landau preaching to his, uh, his students with sort of a hello, hello, and angel like wings, and all the students have you know, donkey ears, and, and he says, Dao Cazal, the master, the Dao said, and so on. Well, there is a page in the theory of elasticity, which is here. I shall translate on site from French to English, and it says, it's a footnote, it says, in fact, the Poisson ratio varies only between zero and one half. Zero and one half. It's for isotropic materials, by the way. Zero and half. We don't know of any body in nature for which sigma, that's the notation for Poisson ratio. But you know a better notation for Poisson ratio? <laughs> <laughs> it's alpha, alpha, alpha dot. Uh, would be negative, that it means, uh, which would bulge out while being stretched. Yeah? Well, faced with this kind of statement, by the way, Randall sheets are much cleverer than I'm making them out be, obviously. Um, it's natural to try to design negative Poisson ratio structures. And once you start looking for them, they are actually dime a dozen. So instead of taking a hexagon, which is a standard hexagon, let's make a, a dented hexagon, a concave hexagon like that. And in that case, you see, as the blue arrows squeeze it, the red arrows go in as well. That's negative Poisson ratio behavior. You can assemble that into a pattern. And there are many other ideas. For example, you see those blocks that are just sitting there, but actually they are hinged in a funny way, and when you start opening them, they open like that. Okay. So each one rotates you know, clockwise, anti-clockwise, and so on in alternation, and they dance together and open up, and that's the, they open in an isotropic fashion when you stretch, or you can do that with triangles, and there are three dimensions, uh, three, version, three versions available as well. At this moment, my conscience I have forgotten what it meant, this conscience thing, but the least thing can um, mention, allude to amplitude hydra. So, it's very nice, so I'm addressing myself to amplitude hedronists, or hed hedrists, or maybe amplitude hedonists, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> May I introduce the term amplitude hedonists? That's the official term. <laughs> 
have a wonderful time. Um, so you, know, you have you have those um, policies, right? Now the gadgets that I'm talking about uh, um, change their shape, obviously. Yes. Well, the 3D versions are a little harder, trickier, because Cauchy proved that if you have a polyhedron, let's say that all the polyhedron are made of paper, yeah, and indeed, so the edges are all glued with scotch tape. That's the best model. Well, if you have a polyhedron like this and convex, Cauchy proved in 1813 that it must be rigid; it cannot change shape. Okay, and then um, in um, 1897. Um, um, Bricard proved, and rather I noticed that, in fact, you can make a polyhedron which changes shape but which is not convex. And unfortunately, it was self intersecting space, so you cannot make it with paper. But finally, in 1977, Connolly, you probably know this story, discovered a polyhedron which is not convex, made of paper, and I made it in paper, lots of people have, with 18 faces, which is deformable, so you, you, it changes shape. Yeah, changes shape. So that is very nice. But the key thing that I would like to call your attention to is that there is something called the bellows conjecture, bellows as in you know, when you stoke the fire, that um, while you have this um, polyhedron which can change its shape, its volume is constant. Huh. And this conjecture is now a theorem. So you actually have invariance of this. And I'm saying that, well, you have, you're playing with those amplitude hedonists, you're playing with those uh, polyhedra and so forth, they encode, you know, scattering uh, calculations and so on. But it might be interesting to see how, what kind of degrees of freedom they have in deformation when you squeeze and so forth, and maybe those deformations encode something physical. Maybe not, worth looking at. But volume is constant. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so, currently, what we used to believe that for isotropic materials, I'll mention the anisotropic case later. Um, the Poisson ratio is not between 0 and 1 half, but minus 1 and half. It turns out the half, the upper bound, has a nice physical interpretation. It's the incompressible limit. Not be confused with the incomprehensible limit. So what it means is that we have a piece of material and you squeeze it, let's say, by a unit, minus 1. Well, it has two <coughs> remaining directions into which they escape. So you have to go 1 and 1 half and 1 half. You're not compensated for minus 1. Why are you taking the trace? Because trace is the derivative of the de determinant, obviously. OK, so, but what about minus 1? That, too, lower bound has an interpretation that's the unshearable limit. Shear, I'd like to remind you, is when you take a deck of cards and you put your palms at the top and at the bottom, and then you try to sort of slide like that, keeping them parallel, so this rectangle becomes a parallelogram. That's shearing. And shearing becomes impossible when you have four isolated material when the Poisson ratio is minus one. So you can prove it in many different ways, but here is the way to do it. So polar decomposition of any square matrix, you don't have to pay any attention to this, means that any square matrix can be written as product of orthogonal and symmetric. Or better, in picture, let's say you have this uh, brown square that I want to share into this uh, blue or green um, parallelogram. You can do it in two steps. Step number one, you take this original brown, and then you stretch it in the red direction, and anti-stretch it to shrink it in the blue direction. So a little bit. And that makes a lozenge, or rhombus. And having made that, you go stomp, rotate it by a small angle, and put it in place. And that, up to higher infinitesimal error, is the same as the result of shearing. And you see, the first step, and so that's of course the orthogonal, uh, sorry, the symmetric part, and that's the orthogonal part of the transformation. But this first part becomes harder and harder as the Poisson ratio becomes negative, because when you stretch it along the diagonal, it wants to stretch also in the anti-diagonal, and that's something that you have to fight. Okay? So minus one is the lower bound. Okay, bearing that in mind, here is uh, another and last sort of hero of the, uh, of the story, and that's Miura Koryo, a Japanese aeronautical engineer who in the 1970s um, came up with this, this very, very beautiful origami pattern called Miura Ori. Ori means, by the way, fold. So I shall give you an actual um, piece of Miura Ori, which is this. You know how annoying it is to fold a road map. Oh, by the way, I said road map, but I just realized, you know, you, Maps used to be made of paper. <laughs> so you know, it's not like this. There, it was an actual piece of paper on which pictures were printed and so on, yes? And when we were going somewhere from Dublin to Cork or something, and you were driving, and you opened this piece of paper, and then so, you know, which way do I go? 
But of course, what happened is that when you open, that was okay. But when you try to fold it back, you never fold it back. Right? <laughs> you know, you would start tearing, start making holes, and you go crazy. And next thing you know, your car is in a tree because you're no longer driving. <laughs> and this happens because there are too many degrees of freedom in these folds. But here's a new reality that I brought. This. And in the glare, you can't really see, but when I want to collapse it, I just have to push two points together, and it collapses automatically. There's only one degree of freedom. And yeah, oop, oop, oop. There is, it's a mathematical constraint. That you can't really do anything else. So this is very nice to make a map from. And, and you should be able to buy those maps. For example, that's a map somewhere in the west of Japan. And you see, this one degree of freedom um, has to do you saw that when I compressed it in one direction, it all compressed it isolatedly. That's negative Poisson ratio if I ever saw one. And those two properties are very intimately connected. It turns out. Okay. I alluded to the fact that Mr. Miura was an aeronautical engineer, and in fact, he was used in that context too. So in the 19, um, at the end of the 20th century, Japan put in orbit an artificial satellite. And one of the challenges of an artificial satellite is you, know, you have to expand huge structures out in space, yeah, in orbit. But when you put it in orbit, into the rocket, you have to fold it and compactly store it. And then what happens, you know, you go into orbit and you try to open it, and it goes and then you get stuck because and then you lose a billion dollars or whatever. <laughs> and that's because there are too many degrees of freedom of you know, failure places. But the idea is if you made these things, for example, in this case, the antenna, but solar panels the same idea, um, with neural already, well, mathematically, it's impossible to get stuck because there's only one degree of room. And you just go into orbit, and you just pull two points apart, any two points apart, and it automatically unfolds. And if it possesses you to fold it back again, you can just do it too. And so that was successfully tried on the Japanese satellite in 1997. Okay. So, so far we have been discussing isotropic things, but the, here is a good point to transit, because Mira Ori is already known as anisotropic, to discuss various anisotropic uh, structures. So let's do this. I have brought here two sheets of paper, two squares, that are cut out from just a printing paper from Dublin. And if I hold them together on one edge here, and then just support them, they sag a little bit in space, obviously, because you know, there's gravity acting. And they sag the same way. They stay stuck together, stick together, because you know, they are made of the same material. They even came from the same. They are, they are you know, siblings from the same piece of paper. So of course, they behave sag the same way under gravity. But when I turn them over, they separate. On one side, they stick together, but on the other side, they separate. There are two squares cut out from the same sheet of paper. But there's more than that. I was supporting them on this edge, yes? Now I'm going to migrate to the next edge and support them like that. This was the separating side a moment ago, but now they're the sticky side. And what used to be the sticky side is the separating side. Okay. What happened? It works for everyone, by the way. Well, what happened is that the, um, those sheets of paper are not isotropic. They are fibers going all over the place. And I don't know which way the anisotropy is running, because I don't have a microscope. But it does not matter. I just cut out two sheets of paper, yeah, and presumably kind of that already in the same way. But when I assembled them, I rotated one against the other by 90 degrees. Yeah. So because I like toys, I brought a toy of this toy, the secondary toy. If you take a sheet and then fold them accordion like, like this, well, this has a property that in this direction it's very flabby. But in this direction, it's rigid. It can actually support weight. Yeah? Because creasing it in one direction means that if you try to bend in the other direction, gas temperature gets in the way. I just whispered it. Okay. So it rigidifies it. So what I did was to take two squares, and I assembled them, excuse me, by rotating them, one against the other. And look what happens. If I put them like that, support them like that, 
the rigid one is supporting the flabby one at the top, but they, when I turn over, they separate because the rigid one is sticking out and the flabby one descends. And that's what happened. So I didn't have to know which way the should be run, running. All I did was to play it against itself. And then that uh, creates this macroscopic sort of asymmetry. Yeah. Similarly, in the 83-year-old history of this august institution, it's probably the first time that somebody brings in a toilet paper into a lecture. <laughs> I harvested it right downstairs. Um, and if you take something like this, it's very easy to tear it in one direction, very straight. But if you try to tear it in the transverse direction, how hard I try? It's basically impossible. It goes zigzag, zigzag, and it's really a mess. And that is also a signature for the anisotropy. By the way, I couldn't help but observing that the toilet paper harvested at the DIAS tears very nicely along lengthwise, but the transverse, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> you think about it. That is <laughs> so, okay. so, we, so we go. OK. Now, let's make a digression to pure mathematics. Here's a funny, but it's not a digression, actually. It's the same thing. You see, I mean, you know, there are some classification schemes for all kinds of science, and you do from this metaphysics, you have the astrophysics, and you do um, high energy physics, and you do amplitude and so on and so on. And you know, if you look at them from this direction, you are scattered all, all over the place. But if you look at it this direction, you are always doing the same thing, right? I mean, so that's, that's, I'm doing always the same thing, but according to some classification of the NSF and so forth. I'm all over the place. But anyway, so this is another thing. Um, Let's say you have a large sphere. By, by the way, when a mathematician says a sphere, they mean a spherical shell, not inside. Inside, when you have a solid ball, they call it a ball. But then anyway, a spherical um, object like this, 2D sphere, sitting inside ordinary 3D space. Can you put it inside a small sphere? And the answer is yes, you just compress it. But can you do it isometrically, that is, without stretching or shrinking? You can bend, but not stretch or shrink. Can you do it isometrically? The answer is obviously no. The obviously no because when you try to squeeze it, you have to do something like that. And when you dent it, you create this kind of um, crater along which you have zero Gaussian curvature. And Gaussian curvature is an isometry invariant, and you can't really do it um, and to squeeze yeah, without doing shrinking or stretching. In this picture, actually, I am shrinking or stretching the surface. So, you can't do it. But, here's a thought. You remember from uh, nursery school that if, in order to cal calculate the Gaussian curvature, you need a second derivative in the fourth term. So, what if we do, try to do it with surfaces that have only first derivatives, but not the second derivatives? They are not regular enough. What? So, the, when somebody like um, you know, Professor Gukov comes to me, oh, you can't do this because you know, Gaussian curvature is an obstruction. I say, what? Gaussian curvature? You can't calculate it. I have only one derivative. That sounds like quibbling, but this was the basis of the great work by Nash and Gromov. Yeah? And the, in fact, they managed theoretically to prove the um, embedding of a large thing into a small space isometrically, but using only first derivative, but not saying that. So C1, not C2. And more recently, concrete construction was actually discovered, really algorithmic um, construction discovered by a French team, Borelli and Tiber, and so on. And this is a picture that Borelli gave me. And here is kind of the halfway model. You take a sphere, and how do you make it much smaller and put it in a small space? Well, you kind of twist it, and you have those wavy patterns on it. But if you look under a microscope, each wavy pattern, each one is corrugated by more wave patterns, and so on and so on. It's nested pattern. It's here to go all the way down. Okay? And when I saw this, ha -ha, this reminds me of something that I have seen before in my life. Not long ago. And so here's what the... Uh, Let's say you take a sheet of paper, and here's a buckling pattern that I would like to um, enjoy showing you, and I hope you enjoy seeing. And you take a pair of uh, straight cylinders, for example, I bought those uh, two um, soda cans, and you put them facing each other with a little gap in between. Okay? And you just roll the paper around them. And when I have rolled them, I twist those cans against each other and squeeze. And when I open up 
the pattern that emerges is a kind of rather beautiful, I don't know if you can see this uh, um, sort of zigzag pattern. Um, I have to wait for the, uh, okay, so you have a zigzag, zigzag, zigzag pattern that emerges. And all that geometry is determined by only one dimensional parameter, that is the ratio of the gap between two, cans, uh, two, two, uh, two cylinders and the diameter of the cylinder. And that controls all of this. This is, by the way, characteristic of what we do. I have been always squashing and, and so on. That means that the only geometry survives. In the course of this process, halfway through, of course, physics is going crazy all over the place. So it will minimize that energy, maximize that thing, and so on. But at the end, because everything has been put in the singular space, only geometry survives. But anyway, so that's the pattern. And that pattern looks very much like the crease pattern, the corrugation pattern on the, on the Bovary there. And this is the best of reasons. Because what did I do? I took a sheet of paper, and then I squeezed it into a small space. I asked nature to do something, and nature responded. And that's her, her answer. So that kind of construction, which is part of what is called the H principle that um, you know, Gromov got a lot of marriage of, and theoretically, and Borei to be able to realize on an algorithmic scale. So that how do you kind of cheat nature, cheat sort of geometry, in order to do things that are apparently unbelievable and satisfy lots and lots of partial differential relations, inequalities, and so forth? I think instead of working very hard, we can ask nature to do this also. Yeah. And that's kind of the beginning of a long, long metaphor. OK. And there is something else that I would like to show, which is somewhat related. Um, I used to work um, on charitable projects in South Africa, and that's where I met my wife. And in particular, you know, I worked at the Ames. I don't know if you've heard it. Um, African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, wonderful place near Cape Town. Um, and also, I worked um, for a nursery school for HIV-positive babies in the town next to, you know, um, in fact, slum next to Cape Town. And uh, this was a very worthy project, and, yeah, but it was also hard because every time I went back, uh, part of the class was missing and so forth. But anyway, um, I used to go to South Africa quite often when I lived in England, and long, long flight from uh, London to Cape Town. And during those flight, one of those flights, I, I met four of this, and, the, and it was a rather kind of um, alarming experience for my fellow passengers, because I got on the plane, and I'm facing a 14-hour flight or whatever, I wrote out a large sheet of paper like this, and they started falling. And my neighbors uh, really wanted to move somewhere. You can even see a coffee stain somewhere here, and so on. But anyway, what emerges, by the way, I didn't spend 14 hours falling. Maybe it's a, an hour job, but you know, I was watching TV, drinking coffee, and so on. But so what happens when I fall is what is this? Ooh. 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 And on the other side, rather cutely, something dual is happening. Yeah? And this is, was, this is a design that was invented by Mr. Motani, another Japanese engineer, a long time ago, and has many, many variations. By the way, if you want to learn how to make um, Miura Ori, um, I can give you a reference, but the Google search will give you lots and lots of wonderful explanations. But Momotani carpet is not well explained in the on the internet, I'm, as far as I can see. I, I'm rubbish at the internet search. But this is kind of thing is passed on from the mouth of an origamist to the ear of an origamist. And I learned it from a friend of mine, I taught it to many people. But anyway, so this is a wonderful thing. Um, it has many interesting properties. For example, see, when I stretch it and release, it bounces. So it's made of a sheet of paper, and yet it has a spring-like behavior, which is a way of putting elasticity into a very, very robust elasticity into a sheet of paper. And naturally, in some sense, that's a punchline. It has negative Poisson ratio, obviously. Yeah? Okay. So I would like to suggest one, one thing for application. Um, you know, I have a wonderful and close friend uh, called Manu Prakash. Maybe you have heard of him at Stanford. He's the champion of frugal science. And that's an entire story. At lunchtime, I'd like to tell you. And, you know, think he's crazy and give you some, uh, show you some toys. But anyway, um, Manu recently had a very, very bad sort of hospitalization experience. And during that, uh, he, he was, his life he was in danger. Thank goodness he's come out. He had to put um, a tube down his throat to the stomach. And he said it was a really sort of painful experience, an uncomfortable experience. So I thought, and he thought, it would be nice to take this piece and then wrap it up like that. Okay? And this thing will have negative Poisson ratio. That means that when you stretch it, it will expand. But when you shrink it, it will, it will sort of become narrower. 
So what you do is to make a tube made of that pattern in some way or other, and when you shove it down your throat, because it's in compression, it becomes narrower and it goes down very, very nicely. And having reached the stomach, you just tug it, and that will make expand it to fit nicely inside your esophagus. Yeah. And you can imagine something like this, not only with a monocline carpet, but with that twist sort of buckling as well. And I have some sort of origami uh, models of this, this kind of thing. Um, that would be an interesting thing to use. Also, it can be used for stents of some kinds, and you know, anyway, the applications are endless. OK, let's uh, go on to for the Jaguar, so to speak. OK. So let's summarize all of these uh, bits of information in the following. Um, this is a standard neurology, which has been the kind of the, um, you know, the main dramatic persona of this uh, second part. And each kind of cell is looking like this. Let's say for simplicity that um, each face is a rhombus, so all the edges have equal length. I can do it in general, in general but the formulas would be far more complicated. So this kind of thing has two parameters. One of them is a geometry parameter, which determines what the neurology has been, how it has been folded. And the other one is dynamic parameter, which means in what kind of state it is in. So the geometric parameter is this alpha, this corner angle. And you know, if alpha is close to 90 degrees, each you know, side is uh, square. And if it's alpha, it's very, very small. It's very long and thin, and so on. And theta is the angle between two neighboring panels, if you like. So if theta is very small, that means it has been completely collapsed. And if theta is almost pi, that means that it's been completely flattened out. Okay, so any state of a mural can be controlled by those two, two parameters. So let's say you have mural that has those two parameters, alpha and theta. In that state, you just you know, press and pull and so on. You look for its response. And it's not difficult to calculate its Poisson ratio. It turns out to be this formula, one minus something you know, one over something larger than one, smaller than one, squared. So that is negative. And if you play with those parameters alpha and theta, you can hit every negative real number, as you can see. Yeah? At this point, you might be wondering, well, what about that theorem that I showed you about you know, lower bound is minus one? But that's an isotropic case. This is not isotropic. Yeah? It's anisotropic. If it's anisotropic, anisotropic means not isotropic. Um, <laughs> you can actually do all sorts of things. Yeah? And so, not only is mirror ori an example of negative Poisson ratio behavior, but it's actually a universal example in the sense that you can hit every negative number that you care to mention by one mirror ori in one state. But there's even more. I talked about buckling. So buckling is usually thought of in terms of Euler buckling. That is, you take a stick and you compress the two ends. And for a while, the stick is compressing elastically. But at some critical load, the stick can't take it anymore. It boom, it buckles out to the side, right? And it's a large deflection. What about the two-dimensional version? What do I mean? You take a membrane. And then you apply an isotropic and homogeneous sort of compression all over the place. How do you do that then, physically? It's actually quite difficult, because if you sort of press the edges, the boundary effect becomes too important. So maybe you have a lattice uh, sort of trellis underneath which shrinks, which, or maybe you can do it thermally in terms of moisture. But however you do it, theoretically, what happens is that when you compress it, um, the membrane compresses the response elastically, but at some critical load, you can't take it anymore, boom, it buckles into a third dimension. And that pattern is actually neurology. So again, Mr. Miro was the, the most wonderful origamist of the generation, but we could have asked nature to invent it. Therefore, Miro is actually the simplest and universal model of negative post ratio behavior in that sense. But at this stage, I thought I realized something. There is a much easier way of realizing negative post ratio. Just crumple at random a sheet of paper. Take a sheet of paper. And when I pull the two ends, it's a sound isotropically. That's an the Poisson. Before you start getting excited, yes. So bird's eye view will give you an empty person, but if you see it sideways, of course, when I crumple, it becomes thicker. So that's, but 
for any epsilon, I can actually have having lots and lots of wave uh, waves inside, which have for a large um, k or small lambda. I can actually put it inside 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 epsilon. So within epsilon, it's negative epsilon. Okay. So within that, so in that quantity sense, it is a very very nice model of negative epsilon. And look, this looks pretty random, right? Okay, it satisfies all those wonderful theorems locally, but you know, it's as random a model that is allowed by nature as I can make it, which is not the mathematician's artifact of drawing a completely generic sort of graph. This is a natural thing. That, and so, this has negative Boston ratio, because I made it that way. I just compressed it isotopically. When I pull it, of course, it expands isotopically. So, this leads us to a rather reckless conjecture. On average, you have seen over a large scale, so locally it's a problem, but the homogeneous and isotropic, and by construction it's negative Poisson. So here is the bold conjecture, which is printed in bold, and far from being exceptional and freakish, you know, negative Poisson used to be thought of as something that is exceptional, probably non-existent, but on the contrary, perhaps a random structure may have negative Poisson ratio in the majority of cases, in some sort of sense to be determined, and that might open up lots and lots of interesting universities. Okay. It's time to wrap up this talk, and I shall philosophize a little bit if I may. So, you know, we scientists, as well as the general public and the broadest uh, sections of society, always live with the impression that science happens in a very, very specialized context. You know, I mean, it happens in labs, institutes internet libraries, classrooms, and that the, you know, but the, when you on a Sunday, the classrooms are closed, the professor goes home, and then you close your books, and then you, know, you switch off your computer, then science ceases to exist, and you can go back to you know, human businesses. Yeah? And the, of course, you also have to write big research grants, and then you have to tout cutting-edge proposals, and so on. And all these are very important, because that's where we expect science to come from. Yes. So you are very justified in asking me, Tadashi Tukeda, why are you playing with paper in the midst of this? By way of an answer, I'd like to share with you a little known, little read piece of Aristotle, which is from the Particles I you. And in this passage, uh, written you know, 2,500 years ago, um, Aristotle is talking about Heraclitus, one of those pre Socratic philosophers who said Pantare and so on. And he was you know, the, uh, the equivalent at that time of a scientific star. Perhaps today's equivalent of a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study or something like this. And the young people came to see Heraclitus, and Aristotle says, well, those young people are naturally expecting, had, had an expectation of this is to read the star of, the, uh, of our time, and probably has a long white beard, and be you know, sitting at the console of a supercomputer typing something complicated, <laughs> or you know, he's lecturing to a thousand people in an auditorium, or whatever, right? And running a huge institute, obviously. But, Aristotle says when those people, young people arrive to see Heraclitus, they found Heraclitus to be completely different. This is Aristotle speaking. In all natural phenomena, there is something of the marvelous. There is a story that some visitors once wished to meet Heraclitus. And when they entered and saw him in the kitchen, warming himself at the stove and playing with children, they hesitated. Is this Heraclitus? You know, sitting by the fire playing with children. But Heraclitus said, Come in, don't be afraid. There are gods even here. In my God, I can tell the tales. It has been a great pleasure and privilege to address this wonderful company. Especially, I would like to thank um, Sergei Gurukov from Nima and Arkan Hamed for their kind invitation. Thank you very much. Because I'm actually, I don't have the appearance, but I'm half blind. I cannot see any of you, actually. I, I have very aggressive retinal detachment. So, so you have to yeah, take the questions. Thank you. I just had a question. If the mirror folded uh, object should have a dependence of its Poisson ratio on another angle, which is the angle with respect to where your 
doing the pushing and pulling. Oh, yes, Lance, um, thank you very much. So the question, the question, the comment was, um, remark which is absolutely correct, is that he, when we had Mueller fold, and they said well, the response shows this um, Poisson ratio, it, I'm always assuming that I'm uh, pulling it um, parallel to the structure, this way, or perpendicular to the structure, that's true. So if you pull it in some random direction, the form is more complicated, but you, know, you, can, you can write it down. But the, uh, the, that is a an, an manifestation, obviously, of the anisotropy of the structure. So I just decided to give the simplest sort of directions, uh, in some sense, the eigen directions. Thank you. Uh, you showed the example of the, the emergence of elastic behavior on the, the folding pattern from an inelastic paper. I was wondering if it uh, just like enhances some like uh, very small elasticity of the paper, or is it just, uh, or would it also work with a completely idealized inelastic paper? The question is, was, um, you know, I showed this um, bouncy behavior, rather jolly behavior, of bounce, 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 and certain spring-like behavior in a sheet of paper, and where does that come from? I mean, is it theoretically if you had something that is absolutely inelastic and folded this, would it happen? And the answer is a little subtle, because when I fold it like this, it has a bouncy, bouncy behavior. But when I fold it like this, it doesn't. It hardly does. So some things work much, much better than others. So the answer is, of course, that in the original paper, there was a little bit of elasticity, which this very judicious folding pattern enhanced dramatically, really by order of magnitude. Whereas if you do it randomly, you don't get that uh, result. But the kind of top-down, so to speak, uh, metaphysical understanding of what enhances this behavior and what sort of discourages beyond what I have just <coughs> told you in the last 20 seconds is really unknown. Uh, just three observations on the talk was, um, the first one is, you showed us the uh, regular pentagon. Yes. Um, now, according to what you did, you had a plain sheet of paper, and you folded it once to make the triangle. So that's a two-ply. That's a, sorry? That's a two-ply triangle. A yes. three-ply pentagon, a four-ply heptagon, wow. a five-ply nanagon. It's not a regular. As a, sh as a shape, as you see it. But that's just by the side. Okay. So then if you take that into no, no, the plates yeah. that you're talking about in South America and the, yeah. the okay, colliding so, so, of so the... Let's, let's, sorry, sorry, sir. Let's make it one question because there are lots of other people who don't ask questions. So I understood it. But the, it is um, within sort of the, the reasonable kind of um, playful spirit of physics representing mathematically, it is a perfectly good regular polygon. Oh yeah, and it is a regular polygon, but it's two ply. That, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. yeah, okay. Then, so then if the plates yeah. are colliding at the Andes, then you have the same two sheets of paper coming together. One goes eight kilometers down and is then brought up through and makes the Andes. So the two plates are, you could say, three-dimensional three plates that are 10 kilometers deep. So as the one goes under, you need time for it to make those Andes that, go a thousand that, kilometers high. Of course, of course, of course. Uh, as the thing, okay? And so then, as you showed in your demonstration with the last item, you had a piece of paper, plain piece of paper. You needed to use force and time to make sure it crumbled. Yes, so can you get to the question, please? No, so that's, the, uh, that you need those okay. forces. So, the, so, the, so the, let me say, I don't know. <laughs> let's, get, let's get to the okay. next question. I don't know. Let's get to the next question. Thank you. Same question I asked you at lunch yesterday. Oh, sorry. The same question I asked you at lunch yesterday. Are there higher dimensional analogs of this? And the, and can, the can question, you, question is, are there higher dimensional analogs of this? Could you take a three-dimensional cube and, and, and fold it into the fourth dimension? And there, there are some, of some of these volume? things. Yes, thank you. So the, are there higher dimensional analogs of this and what about other dimensions instead of two and three? And the answer is that for many things, yes, there are higher dimensional analogs. For example, perhaps most uh, relevantly for this meeting, amplitude hedron, um, the, this Cauchy's rigidity theorem, and the, uh, the fact that when you have a deformable polyhedron, if you like polytope, and the volume is conserved, that's, that's true in 
all dimensions. So that's a very good news. But the other things are very specific to, to 3D. And, and you just apply it again this way or that. But most of them do generalize. When you suspect that it smells uh, like uh, generalizable, then it probably is. Do you have any other questions? W whereas, you know, that twist probably harder to. Are there many other applications like the satellite umbra uh, antenna of this application? Uh, yes, so the question is, are there many applications you know, like the satellite antenna, and, the, and maybe the stent, or maybe the absolute tube? And the, uh, I think uh, probably a reasonable answer is that we are still um, walking among a very fresh garden with lots and lots of low-hanging trees. So there are probably many, many, many applications if more of us um, walked around and looked up. But not many of us are walking around yet. And uh, I don't know my you know, imagination. I also have, uh, my full-time job is to be um, papa to two young children. So you know, you know, I have only so much. Uh, but uh, yes, so I'm sure there are many, many applications. In fact, as many applications as human imagination can make it. But uh, if we don't put in human imagination, there will be no application for the most, most interesting ideas and technology. That, that's the same thing. But I think the applications within kind of pure science is also Rather charming. Oh, rather promising. Yeah, charming. You make them charming. Well, if there are no other questions, I think we should uh, uh, thank our speaker again.